everybody and welcome to today's installment of one of our virtual events here at the Boise Metro Chamber. And today we're talking about a pretty important issue, particularly as it relates to trying to end the COVID-19 pandemic and the struggles that our state has seen uh, with increased infection rates and all the things that come with that. Uh, today's guests I'll be introducing in just a second, but before we get to that, I just wanna thank our sponsor for today's event, which is Blue Cross of Idaho. As you all know, Idaho, uh, the Boise Metro Chamber is the only five-star accredited member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And without the investment of our membership organizations, we would not be able to put together events like this to be able to discuss important current events or educational topics. So before we get started, I'd like to just play this quick uh, bit of information from Blue Cross of Idaho. Back to what I know Back to Idaho Idaho My guests today are Dr. Christine Hahn and Director Dave Jeppesen. Dr. Christine Hahn has been our state epidemiologist since 1996. She attended medical school at Michigan State University and completed a residency in internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic's Graduate School of Medicine. She then completed a fellowship in infectious diseases at Duke University Medical Center and a two-year training program as an epidemic intelligence service officer with the CDC. And that is when she became Idaho State's epidemiologist. She's the medical director for the Division of Public Health, and she served as president of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and remains active in that organization. Locally, she serves on the infection prevention committees of St. Alphonsus and St. Luke's Regional Medical Centers in Boise and is on the board of Idaho's Immunization Policy Commission. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. We look forward to speaking with you. Next, we have Director Dave Jeppesen. Dave was appointed in 2019 by Governor Little to the, be the director of the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, a cabinet position in the governor's administration. A native, native of Burley and Ammon, Idaho, he earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Idaho State University, and he also holds a master's of applied statistics degree from The Ohio State University. After graduation, he worked at Capital One in Richmond, Virginia, then he moved to Barclays Bank's United Kingdom Retail Bank in London as the chief marketing officer. And in 2009, they moved back to Eagle, Idaho, where he started a successful bank consulting business. And since 2012, he's worked in the healthcare industry. He started at Blue Cross of Idaho, where he was the chief marketing officer, and then moved into the governor's cabinet. Director Jefferson is also on the Idaho State University's Foundation Board and is married to his wife, Stacy, who is also an ISU grad. And Director Jefferson, I added that because I'm also an Idaho State grad, and I thought that would be pretty important for this conversation today. Welcome to both of you. I know COVID has just twisted our worlds all over the place. How are the two of you handling it? We'll start with you, Dr. Hahn. Yeah, well, um, I've always felt like I have a really busy job. Um, you know, uh, public health is, uh, there's always something going on. Um, many of you know, we've had outbreaks in years past. We have everyday diseases that we are tracking and, and we are working to educate the medical um, community and, and the public about what's going on every year. Uh, but this year, I feel like, uh, you know, if it's to be if it's possible, I feel like my my uh, job and the job of those around me has just, including the director, uh, I'm sure has doubled. Um, it's incredibly busy. And not only that, I think the other big change for all of us is the intense level of scrutiny on what we do. We're used to, we're, we know we need to be accountable. Uh, we work to be accountable for what we do. And we put out our annual reports and our, you know, our press releases when needed. But this has been obviously way beyond what we are used to operating under. So I would just say it's been a really intense, um, intense, but a really important time for us. Well, I know it's an incredibly hard job right now. And we're thankful that you're here to talk with us today. 
Director Jepson, how's it how's it going for you? How have you how have you and your family handled this bizarre time? Well, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, we're doing pretty well. I, as I tell people, this turned out to be my most interesting job I've ever had, uh, and uh, certainly the last year has added to the level of interesting things that are taking place. Um, fortunately, I have a wonderful wife and one son at home still that uh, are very supportive and uh, have been uh, great to help. You know, make sure things get managed on the home front while I, I spend a little bit more time at work these days. Uh, but I would echo what um, Dr. Hahn has said. It's been a very interesting year from a learning perspective. And, uh, um, you know, for a guy who was never looking to get on a press conference, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a little bit different this year. Uh, and early in those press conference experiences, my 17-year-old son used to like to watch, and then he would make it a point to text me instructions while I was on camera. So I was always trying to deal with the buzzing in my pocket while trying to focus there. But uh, other than that, it's, it's been just all right. So well, That's great. Well, thank you both for being here and let's just jump into it. Uh, my first question, Director, is for you. You know, in October, the governor uh, created the uh, vaccine committee that was that was in place to kind of plan out the distribution and the implementation of the vaccines when they finally came. At the end of the year in December, Pfizer's was the first one to arrive, followed by Mo Moderna's. Talk a little bit about that process, where are we at now, and, and how is it looking as we move forward? Uh, great, Matt. Um, happy to talk about that. We um, were very fortunate that just 42 days after the uh, DNA was sequenced for the coronavirus is when Moderna started its first clinical trial. And so these vaccines are truly uh, modern science miracles. Um, they've moved, they're very effective, very effective, and, and so far this, and it's the safe, safety side has been very good as well. Um, and we were fortunate that we got our first doses uh, starting on December 14th. Um, and so, so far we've been receiving weekly uh, doses of both Pfizer and Moderna, um, and uh, seeing those get into the arms of Idahoans has been very rewarding as we see that as the beginning of uh, the long-term solution here for this, uh, for this pandemic. Uh, and so that will continue uh, going forward. And we hope to see um, the additional vaccines that are in clinical trial uh, come to be able to be used very soon, hopefully within the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, there's two more that may be likely to come into the mix, which will help us out a great deal as well. Uh, and as you know, we're really starting with uh, healthcare workers and long-term care centers, both staff and residents. And just uh, earlier this week, uh, the governor opened it up to uh, frontline workers that were first responders, teachers, those that work in correctional facilities. So uh, definitely a lot going on and uh, moving forward as quick as we can to get all those doses uh, safely into people's arms. You know, it it is going to be such a huge endeavor to get all of these vaccines out to everyone. And Dr. Han, one of the challenges that, I mean, and as mentioned in your bio, you've been our state's epidemiologist since the mid 90s. And it beginning in the mid 90s with the rise of access to information through the internet and some really questionable scientific research, there's become a backlash uh, and some conspiracy type feelings toward vaccines. Can you just talk a little bit about vaccine safety records and help dispel some of the concerns that might be out there? Yeah, sure. I think the important thing to remember is that vaccines are are like other therapeutic uh, therapeutics that are licensed uh, uh, by the FDA and and prescribed by doctors. Uh, obviously, the COVID vaccine is still are still those are both still uh, experimental vaccines. They're under emergency use authorization. But every vaccine is, um, again, like every drug, um, you take it because you believe the benefit is greater than the risk. It's not that there's zero risk. When I'm asked to talk about safety, um, I always hesitate to imply that we think anything is 100% safe. You know, your Tylenol is not 100% safe and your, your Advil is not 100% safe. Uh, but it's important as a consumer that we all educate ourselves. We know that with vaccines, um, yes, these vaccines that came out uh, for COVID were faster than usual. You know, Operation Warp Speed really implies a very rapid, and it was a very rapid development. Uh, but the clinical trials that they did 
do, and they're still following these folks, they included uh, like 15,000 people in each of the groups, whether they got the vaccine or got the placebo. That's a lot of folks to have followed along. And now they've been at going out several months now. Uh, so there is data coming in on this vaccine. Uh, also, of course, these vaccines are being used in other countries. So we are, uh, the America is closely watching the data out of Europe um, and other uh, countries uh, and it, that are using the exact same vaccines that we are. Um, but we do know that it's important to continue to watch vaccines as they get rolled out. And we have a very robust uh, safety monitoring system, not only at the national level, but also in Idaho. Um, I myself have received the first dose of the vaccine and I got an app from CDC that I get a text message every single day asking me, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Any problems, any fever? I have to sit there and go, no, no, no. And I submit that every single day to CDC. And that is what uh, many, they have a very high uptake of people reporting in. So we are getting lots of data. Uh, I think I think that uh, we will know more as time goes on. To quickly address the anti-vaccination issue, really anti-vaccination movements started at the same time. The very first vaccines were introduced to the public in the 1800s. And this was in the what was then England um, in the United Kingdom. And this was in the 1800s with smallpox vaccine. So it's nothing new. It's nothing that uh, we don't expect. And we understand that um, it's a different uh, measure when you feel perfectly well. Um, you, it's harder to take something that might have a small risk than if you're already sick and you're thinking about taking, let's say, chemotherapy or something else that we know have some nasty side effects, but we do believe uh, that it's worth it. So uh, healthy skepticism is human nature. We think it's important that we, we respond to that, of, with that need for information by giving information, not over reassuring, not over promising, but saying this is what we know so far, um, you, deciding ourselves. And I, I feel like talking about the fact that I've received the first dose of the vaccine should speak to my confidence in its safety. Um, I had a mild sore arm and that's it. I know other people get a mild fever, uh, but the doctors that I've talked to and the nurses have said, I know that's my immune system working. So they don't actually mind that reaction. They know that that's, that's a good sign that their immune system is, is reacting. So the one safety signal that has come out and that's already been published in, uh, 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 in, uh, by CDC is uh, allergic reactions. So people that have had a history of an, a severe allergic reaction to an injected medication or to another vaccine, they need to take special caution, maybe talk to their doctor, maybe wait for another vaccine down the road. So that's the one thing that we have seen with these vaccines is some people getting allergic reactions. It's about... Uh, one in a million is what most vaccines are cited as far as allergic reactions. For this one, it seems to be about 10 uh, in a million that seem to have a, a nasty allergic reaction to it. Usually treatable. Nobody has died from this. But nonetheless, that is, a, that is something to really be concerned about and then we are following. And that, that really is why it's important that the folks that are administering the vaccine keep the patient for a while and have epinephrine handy just from a treatment perspective. You have a 10 in a million chance, but they have it ready. Exactly. That is actually true for all vaccines. I don't know if you've taken your kids in, if you know, those in the audience have taken your kids in for vaccines that they are observed for a little bit. Uh, but for this vaccine, it is recommended everybody wait at least 15 minutes. And if you had any type of issues with allergic reactions, up to a half hour of observation just to be on the safe side. And like you say, have epinephrine handy. That's something that vaccinators are supposed to have handy anyway, uh, if they're if they provide vaccines for the public. You know, the, the large scale rollout of trying to, to vaccinate the U.S. population has been challenging for the, for the country. Um, but in Idaho, we are seeing some gains. We've got a slightly smaller population, but we are seeing some gains in terms of making sure that people are getting vaccinations. Director, could you speak a little bit to who's, who's been vaccinated and by the end of February, what do you anticipate in terms of uh, people getting vaccinated in Idaho? Uh, great, Matt. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, our first group that's been vaccinated is the uh, healthcare workers, for the obvious reason that we need to preserve healthcare capacity and, and protect those that are not only giving vaccines, but that will treat those that uh, continue to come in to be with, with COVID. And long-term care um, facilities, both staff and residents, that's some of our most vulnerable res uh, populations that live in those facilities, and um, particularly for staff who go in and out to make sure that they've been vaccinated as well. Um, and so that's where we are now. We're in that phase right now. 
Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we uh, opened up, or the governor opened up on um, Tuesday this week, excuse me, the uh, additional groups of uh, teachers, um, uh, emergency responders, and uh, and those that work at correctional facilities. Uh, and that list can be found at uh, coronavirus.idaho.gov under the vaccine tab has a list of what the priority groups are uh, and estimated timelines. That'll run, That, that we anticipate um, at the first part of February that we will uh, also move to the 65 and older group. That was a change that was made at our coronavirus vaccine advisory committee and, and approved by the governor just this last week. Uh, and then towards the middle part of February, we anticipate opening it up to the rest of what we're calling frontline essential workers. Uh, basically, those are um, workers, the critical infrastructure workers that cannot telework. Uh, and there's a list of those again on our website. Uh, CVAC, uh, the Coronavirus Vaccine Advisory Committee still has to vote on those, but that we have our current proposal out there so people can see that. Uh, and we continue to see the volume of vaccines increasing. Um, this is not just like uh, COVID is not like the flu. The vaccine is not like the flu vaccine. It requires some extra handling because of the temperature requirements and some observation, uh, as you were talking about a minute ago with Dr. Hahn. Uh, and so we've really seen providers to have basically no instructions on December 14th and on December 15th start to receive vaccine. Uh, and it's taken, you know, it takes some time to get staff trained and to get your processes set up and to to get moving on those vaccinations. Um, and what we saw from week three to week four was a increase of about 67% in the number of doses administered. And we were seeing continued increases this week as well. Um, and you can see those numbers on our COVID, uh, coronavirus.idaho.gov website, where we report both people vaccinated as well as total doses, as well as a new dashboard that we have out there. Um, looking forward, we'll, uh, we will move into the next priority groups as they get approved by our, corona, our coronavirus vaccine advisory committee, and we anticipate moving into that group three uh, should supply hold up uh, somewhere in the March, early March timeframe. And so if, if you were, um, if you had a crystal ball, would you say that really truly by May or June, that members of the general public should be able to access this moving forward and we should um, be at a place where the, the folks that are considered healthy ages, you know, 35 to 55 would be getting vaccines pretty easily? Yeah, um, well, the further we get out, the less, uh, as, a, as a statistician, the further we get out, the higher <laughs> the variability of the prediction. Uh, but that's certainly where we'd like to be. We'd like to be by the end of summer that anyone that had, wants to be vaccinated can be vaccinated. And ideally that would put us in a position uh, when we can go back to school, that we can get into the flu season, when people go back indoors, that we have uh, those that want to be vaccinated, vaccinated. That will depend on supply and uh, being able to get all those doses out, but that's really where we're trying to get to. And Dr. Hahn, th I mean, these vaccines, uh, the speed at which they were developed has been head spinning for those of us that aren't scientists. I mean, it really is a, a miracle of modern medicine uh, from that perspective. And it's a new technology. So could you talk just a little bit about what mRNA vaccines are, how they're different, and, and for that matter, why it may revolutionize how we look at vaccinations? Yeah, so mRNA, you know, my daughter is 16 and she's taking uh, biology right now and <laughs> we've been talking about RNA and I've been trying to relate to her how important it is to know this stuff. I think she's like, why do I need to know this arcane information? So mRNA is messenger RNA and some of us might remember that from our biology classes, uh, but haven't thought about it much since. But that's the way viruses work. Uh, viruses um, are little capsules of genetic material, and uh, but they don't have the ability to divide and, and replicate on their own. They need our cells to do that. So if you have a natural viral infection, whether it's a cold or the flu or coronavirus, what's happening is that virus gets into your body and your cells are kind of hijacked and the, that messenger the RNA that they bring in with them or DNA with some viruses, that, that genetic material is released in your cells and your cell goes, oh, genetic material, I'm gonna use that and I'm gonna make copies and it, do, it does its job. Well, the vaccine is just imitating what a whole virus would do. Um, it's doing that exact same thing. It's really something that's, even though it's new to all of us, this technology has been in development for years and years. Everybody uh, hoped for and saw the promise in this technology. And in fact, they're working on other uh, things that this, this might help us with down the road. 
costs, but uh, it's almost like simple, it, be beautifully simple in that what it, this vaccine is doing now is it's delivering this messenger RNA, just like a virus would, but it's only a little piece of genetic material, so it can't infect you like the way a whole virus would. Uh, and what, what it does is it, it takes your body and your immune, uh, your, your body makes those little pieces of virus and your immune system reacts to that and gets immunity from it. So it's really um, a nice technology. It's much faster than some of the other technologies for vaccines that have in the past required you to have to culture things in the lab. And after you culture it, then sterilize it. So there's no risk of live, uh, like what we all recall with polio vaccine, how there were mistakes made early on with live virus getting out into the, into the vaccine. That's not possible with this technology because it never starts with a live virus. Um, so it's really, really um, interesting. Um, obviously, anything new, uh, we're all going to be learning as we go. We would rather have had this not have to come out this way um, and take more time. Uh, but uh, so far, the data has been that the, the effectiveness of this vaccine of over 90% is astonishing. Even the experts have been surprised by that. You may recall the FDA early on said, well, gosh, as long as it's 50% protective, we'll take it. We'll accept that because we just need something. And um, to have both these vaccines um, work uh, with over 90% um, efficacy is really is astonishing and wonderful. That says, that said, I already mentioned that there are some people that have an allergic reaction to the vaccine. And so, uh, you know, we are going to have to keep watching that, making sure that uh, this vaccine is safe. Another issue that's come up, of course, is with these new strains out there um, that have been identified in the United Kingdom and also in Africa. And now, of course, is starting to pop up in other countries is how well are these vaccines going to work against these strains that are that are starting to develop? So far, it looks good. Um, listening to some of the scientists talk about this so far, they believe that these vaccines will still be effective, but we'll have to keep watching that as well. You know, as a as a follow up for that, um, how will this work uh, moving forward? So, um, in other words, will people need a booster shot over time? I mean, is this a permanent vaccine like some of the others? Is it something that would get wrapped into flu shots? Do you know how that's that's going to fit into this whole process? Uh, the answer is no, and no, but nobody knows yet. Um, what we do know is that natural coronavirus infections. So there are other coronaviruses out there that circulate and they're, they're cold viruses. They're, they, they can cause the common cold. Um, immunity to those viruses does not last very long naturally. So there is concern that with the virus, the vaccine, uh, we may also start to see waning immunity over time. But there's no way to know that other than following, starting with those people that volunteered for those first clinical trials uh, and following uh, people over time and seeing how long that immunity lasts. So whether it's going to be a one time shot or whether we're going to need annual boosters, it gets mixed into your flu shot. We just don't know that yet. You know, uh, director, um, for those of us in the general public, sometimes it's, you know, this has impacted people's freedom to travel. It's definitely impacted people in their pocketbook in terms of being able to work. But the gist of it is, can you help us see the light at the end of the tunnel? When do you see, and I know as a statistician, the further out you get, the harder it is to tell, but when are other experts and nationwide experts predicting that we'll start to get back to a sense of normalcy, which for my daughter is a mask and she's three. So, but a normal for an adult. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, you know, that's a, it's a very good question. That's the question that I <laughs> get asked at home, frankly. Um, and it's really going to depend on a couple of variables. One is uh, the rate at which vaccination is done and the uptake that happens in the community uh, will drive kind of how long that takes us to get back to uh, at life without a pandemic. And the other is um, how much viral activity is taking place in the community as well. Uh, so it's actually, um, if you have a tremendous amount of viral activity, lots of people getting sick, uh, it actually takes longer to get to a point where um, uh, where you can get back to kind of quote unquote out of the pandemic or back to life without a pandemic. Uh, and so those are the two variables that we are watching. Obviously, we still have a fairly high uh, amount of viral activity uh, of, of people getting sick in the community, higher than we would like, better, better than it was in December, but still higher than we would like. 
Um, and that actually tends to push things out because uh, if you have low viral activity, you can sort of get back to life uh, a little bit faster as you go through the vaccination process than if you have high viral activity. So, you know, I would say, you know, our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to allow people that want to get the vaccine to hopefully get that done through the summer. Uh, and so I, in an ideal world, we would be looking at somewhere later this year to get out of a, quote, a pandemic life. Uh, but, you know, the things could, could stretch out and it could stretch out, frankly, until the end of this year or even into early next. And so um, I think we have a little while ahead of us before we get out of a, a pandemic lifestyle. That was good news. Um, <laughs> well, you asked, Matt. So. I know, I know I did. Uh, doc, Dr. Han, uh, one of the other questions about vaccines right now is right now vaccines are only approved. The two vaccines that are out are only approved for as early as age 16. I think only one of them is 16. The other one's a little older than that. I know Pfizer has been doing research on the vaccinations down as early as children age 12, but how long is it going to be before we're able to vaccinate our children for this? And for that matter, given the way that children interact with this differently, how big of a concern is it for uh, experts like you? Yeah, so as you say, uh, there are two vaccines. One is only authorized for 18 and above, and the other one is authorized for 16 and above. And that is based, of course, on who they studied it in. You know, uh, the initial trials were you know, obviously focused on adults, especially older adults. They made a big effort to enroll older adults because that's who where we really, really needed to see that it worked. Um, and of course, great news on that front. However, for, for children right now, we don't have a solution. Um, there are, as you say, ongoing trials in children. Um, and I just heard my my first update on that today in, in, a, in a call with CDC. Um, they're just just some very, very uh, background information on those trials and uh, but no data yet, no results yet. So we don't yet know how well they'll work in children. I think most people assume they will. Usually vaccines work best in young people and the older you are, the less likely they are to, to do well. Um, now, that said, um, when might kids get vaccinated? Obviously, um, we need to see the data uh, that needs to be reviewed. First of all, the manufacturers have to feel like it's showing that it works. Then they file with FDA, FDA reviews. Then CDC comes together uh, with their advisory committee and makes recommendations on its use. So it, there's there are several steps that have to happen. Um, as the director said, we would love to have the kids go back to school next fall and, and feel like things are getting back to normal. And obviously having kids vaccinated would be incredibly helpful. Um, most kids do better than adults, of course. That's, that's very well known. Uh, but we do know some kids have really severe outcomes. Um, in Idaho, we've had 10 cases of children with uh, what's called multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome of children um, and they all had to be hospitalized. Uh, one child even, you know, uh, reportedly was waiting for a heart transplant due to complications. Um, in addition, overall, we've had 115 children. They weren't diagnosed with that syndrome, but they were hospitalized. So um, even though this is uh, definitely kids tend to fare better than adults, no doubt, um, we've had we've had a number of children hospitalized with the disease. Thankfully, um, all have recovered or are recovering, uh, but it's a reminder that kids can get hit hard with this as well. Um, so um, I'm hoping, um, I think that they, if, if we do um, get good data from the trials and good you know that it works. Uh, it'll probably be this summer that we would before we would be able to get to children. Um, obviously, the focus right now being on uh, the groups that the director has outlined. You know, adults with underlying health conditions will have to go soon. The uh, seniors, um, hopefully, very soon, and the groups that we're working on now, healthcare providers and some frontline essential workers. You know, I saw a post today, Director Jepson, on social media of somebody who is scheduling their vaccine, and they're a teacher. And so it sounds like teachers are now starting to be able to get in line for their uh, vaccines. The question that I have is, since President Biden has announced his 100 million vaccinations in his first or in his first 100 days, how how are we in Idaho going to match that pace? I mean, the rollout here is has, has been effective, but it hasn't been fast necessarily. And it seems to me that to do that type of vaccination at that rate 
it, it can't just be doctor's offices. So are we going to see vaccination in pharmacies? Are we going to see field clinics using the National Guard? Like, what are we going to see in order to hit those kind of numbers in the president's first hundred days? Now, that's a that's a question and a um, an, an item that we spend a lot of time every day uh, here at Health and Welfare and in the public health district thinking through. Um, and in this first phase where it was healthcare workers, the, the number of places that the vaccine went was not the full vaccination network of providers, uh, mostly be, for, for many reasons, but many because we were targeting specifically healthcare workers. As we get ready to move into this next phase, uh, we really anticipate uh, leveraging the full spectrum of vaccination providers. Uh, and that would be uh, primary care doctors, um, physicians, uh, uh, clinics at, uh, at, um, at pharmacies, uh, setting up, uh, particularly for these types of uh, categories that are employment driven, setting up clinics at specific uh, specific employers or groups of employers to drive that at the place of employment, uh, those sorts of things. And so, yes, we're going to need to move beyond just vaccinating at hospitals and a few doctors, which is where we are now, to um, you know all of the doctors that are available to do that and through the pharmacies. Um, as, if that is not going to be enough capacity, and we're still learning how much capacity we have as we kind of implement this brand new vaccine and process around it, yes, we will look to uh, larger events, um, particularly as we get to these uh, groups like 65 and older or those with underlying health conditions. And actually, in some parts of the state, that's already happening. Um, I believe an event, a, a kind of a, a mass vaccine event, if you will, at a at a public location is taking place um, up north in District 1 and District 2 is planning one of those as well, a public health District 2, which is up around the Lewiston area. So we're really taking a, a very close eye on capacity and uh, are prepared to really leverage all of our existing capacity and build additional capacity as needed. So you're not sure if it'll involve the National Guard yet? <laughs> I suspect that we will see the National Guard be involved. So if I was going to bet on that, I would bet on yes. Okay, great. You know, Dr. Han, these, the two that are out right now require two shots. Um, there's been a lot of consternation about the fact that many people from a healthcare perspective don't have the best follow through. They might get the first shot, but what about that second shot? What are the things that are being put in place to ensure that citizens I know personal responsibility is important, but what are we also doing to ensure that there's a reminder and that we actually get them in the office or the field clinic to get that second vaccine? Yeah, that's a great question, Matt. And I think that's that's another thing we talk about all the time. We are working on hopefully um, announcing a tool next week that is part of that's going to be um, kind of shot reminders. Uh, I mentioned the um, safety uh, texting that, that I receive uh, from CDC after having received the vaccine. And part of that is also a shot reminder. And when I called the clinic and said, oh yeah, I better make my second appointment. They said, oh yeah, we already got you scheduled. <laughs> so I was, I think the clinics are um, taking, there's kind of different levels of that. You mentioned personal responsibility. Of course, that's where it always starts. Uh, but the, uh, some of the systems in place are uh, not only the, the text reminders if for folks that sign up for that, um, also, um, I co-signed a letter with Elke Shaw Tulloch, our public health administrator, that where the state is going to be reminding people who've gotten that first shot once they're if they if they agree to be in our registry, then they will get letters from us as well saying, hey, please don't forget to sign up for your second shot. We're also hoping that the providers, like the provider where I got my vaccine, uh, takes it upon themselves. Uh, many providers' offices have um, reminder systems. You've we've all gotten the reminder to go to your get get your dental visit or get your pet in for their <laughs> rabies shot. In a similar way, um, providers' offices are working on ways to make sure that they're reminding their patients to come back for that second dose. So it's, um, you know, I think neither the director nor I would try to oversimplify it and say it's going to be easy, but we, uh, I think multiple levels of um, uh, um, kind of folks working on this and trying together to make sure that that patient gets there for the second shot. And then when they show up, that dose is there. Um, you've probably heard the recent announcement, I think it was earlier this week, uh, from the Trump administration that they are going to start sending out those second doses sooner instead of kind of reserving them. So we're adjusting our plans and uh, making sure that we have a system in place to make sure that when people need that second dose, that doctor or that clinic has that second dose for them. 
I, I want to talk a little bit about information and different types of information deserts that will have an impact on making sure that we reach that herd immunity. And the first one is the folks who tend to be the most vulnerable to COVID, those folks that are 65 and in, for that matter, 70 and older, tend also to be folks who are least likely to be regularly on the internet and um, using internet tools like apps, app-based programs and stuff like that. So my question is, uh, for you, Director Jepson, what are you doing to uh, help get the message out statewide, particularly to those senior citizens that have now been moved up in the phasing to make sure that they know that they can go in and get a vaccine? And have you found that you've successfully reached that population because it is the one that has the disproportionate death rate and it is the one that really needs access to these as quickly as possible? Uh, thank <coughs> Thanks, Matt. We actually um, are, are want to make sure we get the word out to uh, all of those people that, that qualify, the 65 and older category, that they're coming up pretty quick here. And so we've used a multiple channels to do that. Um, we have uh, obviously used some online channels, but to make sure we have this demographic specifically, uh, we've instituted weekly press briefings. Uh, and those, because we know this population tends to watch the evening news, so we can get that information into the evening news. Uh, we've put on our website the, the estimated timing and the uh, groups that are eligible. You can find that at coronavirus.idaho.gov. Uh, and while, as you mentioned, some of that population 65 and older may not be going there to get that information, what we found is the media does pick it up and we, we know that that group does watch, uh, watch the, the traditional news, for example. Um, the other thing that we've done is, is really relied on uh, the word getting out from, through public health districts, uh, through their communication channels they have with specific audiences. Uh, but probably our best uh, best communication channel for those 65 and older uh, is really through their existing physician. Uh, so 65 and older means they qualify for Medicare. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of that population has a physician or is, is, has some type of physician relationship. Uh, and we'll be looking for those physicians to reach out to their patients uh, and help remind them uh, that this, they're now eligible and they, either they can get vaccinated in that physician's office if they're participating in the vaccination program or be able to direct them to a location such as a pharmacy or another physician practice that can get them vaccinated. So we're really going to try all of those channels uh, through mass media, through you know, targeted messages with our public health district partners and through their physicians to make sure they know that it's their turn and it's time to come in. We've also found that particularly at 65 and older, um, as you mentioned, this is the most impacted age group uh, of, of all age groups in this uh, terrible disease, and their interest is very high. So we also are seeing them reach out, um, and they tend to have pretty tight social circles. And so we're depending on the good old fashioned word of mouth of uh, sharing with friends and neighbors uh, that may or may not be through social media, but we, we find that they, they tend to talk to each other as well. So that's uh, what we're looking at. And it, coupled with that, Idaho is a pretty rural state, Dr. Hahn. I mean, we have urban centers where a preponderance of our population is, but those those rural areas tend to be uh, have less access to consistent information. They also tend to be a little bit more spread out with less resources. Hospitals don't have as much resources. What are we doing to really ensure that our rural communities get this protection and get access at the same level that urban communities where there's higher density do? Yeah, uh, Matt, thank you. That's obviously an incredibly important question. Um, I, I think about it in two ways. One is, um, one is what are we doing proactively to try to make sure that's happening? And I'll tell you, we lean very heavily on our local public health districts. Um, that's one thing I really like about the system in Idaho, where we have uh, strong local public health districts that cover multiple counties. They know their communities well. They know the providers. They know uh, where people go to get vaccinated. They have partners. They've been they built up over the years and they have been doing a really good job of getting that vaccine out there into the rural communities. The second half of that is watching it and monitoring it. And just today I looked at our vaccination rates by county. Um, the director mentioned on our website, we do have the number of doses administered by county of residents of people. Well, how is, uh, how is that going? Is it fair? 
right now is a little early to make any judgment calls because it's mostly been uh, healthcare workers, right? So it's going to be centered in areas with large hospitals and things like that. But we're going to keep watching that closely over time. And if we see counties that are lagging or falling behind, then we can work with the local health district and see what's the what's the challenge there, what's the problem, or do we not have enough clinics, do we need to set up a mass clinic? So there's really uh, the two sides of that, trying to make sure we're thinking about um, rural communities ahead of time, but also tracking it, watching it. Um, and I've been really impressed so far. In fact, some of our local small rural communities, they're the first ones we've heard back from saying, hey, we have vaccinated all our healthcare providers in our area. Yes, we've thought about the dentists and the physical therapists and we've done all that. We're ready to move on. And it's actually been the rural communities in some cases that have gotten to their target populations the fastest. You know, we're at about 40 minutes and I just have so many questions. I've got one question that came in while we were here. And that question, I I think, Dr. Hahn, this is probably for you. And that is, and my initial reaction will, is, well, beggars can't be choosers. But the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one-dose vaccine that is supposedly coming along through its process and will hopefully be available sometime early this year but the reports indicate that it might only have a 70% success rate instead of a 95% success rate. What is your take on that? And again, like I said at the beginning, my initial response was better yeah. than none, but I, I wanted to know your perspective on that. And, and also, just how is the vaccine different? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I, w one thing, you know, I think, uh, Anybody who's worked in this field as long as I have, you know, I, I think when I first came in all full of fire, it was like, I'm going to just tell people this is the right way to go. But one thing I think we've learned is that people do the best when they're given choices and then they can inform themselves and make decisions. Uh, certainly, um, if you're someone who's, uh, let's say you can't take a vaccine right now, um, maybe you're pregnant and even though it's okay for pregnant women to get vaccinated, you're hesitant. You don't want to do that. You want to wait. Some people are going to, going to want to wait. You might just want to wait. I've heard people say, I just want to give it a few more months and see how other people do. We understand that. Um, there will be a, choi a, a, a choices for you. Um, I have a family member, for example, who's had an anaphylactic reaction, a severe allergic reaction to another medication. An, an injectable medication. Uh, so I've said, you know, I don't think that you should get the uh, one of these mRNA vaccines. Let's wait for the you know the next one to come along. There are lots of things that go in the mix. Each vaccine will be a little different, and I'm just glad that we're going to have a selection. It's kind of like the flu shot. You probably know that most of us think of it as the flu shot, but there are actually multiple brands out there. There's live vaccine. There's high dose vaccine for seniors. And I think in the same way, there's going to be a selection out there and that's going to allow especially people that might have concerns about one particular vaccine or another for certain reasons that they can have a choice. Myself, I didn't have any reason to worry. I've never had a severe reaction to any sort of medication. Um, I like that over 90% effective really speaks to me. Uh, and I wanted to get it as soon as I could, as soon as I was eligible. So for me, it was easy to go ahead and get it now. But I certainly think anybody who wants to wait those other vaccines, there are at least, you know, three others out there in the United States in clinical trials. My my thought would be we don't know yet. We don't know how well they'll work. We don't know how safe they'll be either. Uh, but if you want to wait, um, that's not unreasonable. And certainly keep your eyes peeled. And as those vaccines come out, we will start, um, as the director has already mentioned, we put stuff on our website. We will talk to our advisory committee. Uh, and a lot of other information will come out about those vaccines. I appreciate that clarification. And uh, Director Jepson, you were talking about the different phases in which people will be eligible. And I can't remember which phase you said would be those frontline workers, those folks in the hospitality industry and those folks at grocery stores, when they'll begin to be eligible. And we had a clarifying question come in on one of the comments that just when will the essential workers like hospitality in particular be eligible for those vaccines? Um, that's a great question. I'm actually going to look real quick on the website here. Uh, and I think that those that and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dr. Hahn, but I believe that is now in what we are calling group three, because what we're looking at in group two is over 65 and what we're calling frontline essential workers. So that's actually defined by that at the national level. But Dr. Hahn, correct me if I have that uh, incorrect. There. Yeah, Matt, would you be averse if I put the link to that document in the chat? Sure. Um, and I can also put it in the uh, on the screen as well. So it's coronavirus.idaho.gov. 
Yep, but then uh, I've just put in the chat the link directly to the document that the director and I look at many times a day uh, because we want to make sure we're getting it right. This document is constantly being updated. In fact, I heard there's more tweakages going on to, uh, as we speak uh, to hopefully be more and more clear. Uh, but um, we, we want to make sure that it's a living document and that we're always updating it. You can see that now uh, the governor uh, selected three groups and they're eligible now in addition to the healthcare personnel, long-term care residents. That's, that's our firefighters, police, safety personnel, teachers, of course, and other school personnel, and then corrections. Um, so really that's who's eligible now. Next will be the seniors as the director has alluded to. And then starting in mid-February is where we get into some of the other essential workers. You can see their uh, grocery convenience store food pantry, um, et cetera. Um, the, I think with the hospitality, as uh, the director indicated, uh, uh, we don't have the numbers up there, group one, two, three, but I think they will fall into, right now, as it stands, they would fall into that other essential workers group starting in March. Wow, great. I've got one last question for both of you. I mean, Dr. Hahn, you've worked in state government since, uh, you know, over 20 years and, and uh, Director Jepson, you were involved either indirectly in your role uh, in in the healthcare industry and now directly, but how has COVID impacted you and how has it impacted your view of how the government should be involved and how it interacts with our daily lives? And Director Jepson, would you like to start? Sure, Matt. Um, that's a, a great question. And actually, um, one of the roles of government is to provide for the health and safety uh, of, of a population of, of the people that are being served by that government. Uh, and the reason for that is, and particularly in public health, is public health is really a group effort. It's, it's not any one individual or even one, in, one organization uh, that can really manage uh, and, and be able to deliver public health across the whole public. Uh, and so what I've come to appreciate in this role uh, is that there is a specific places that the government does uh, provide an important and unique service in the role of public health. Uh, and that's really around being a couple of things. One is being a source of truth of what, uh, uh, what the current science is and what the current best practices are. We're very fortunate to have someone as talented as Dr. Hahn uh, to help us with that science side. Uh, the second is to really um, be able to coordinate across many diverse um, healthcare entities and healthcare providers to provide solutions that help um, uh, mitigate the effects of a negative, in this case, the pandemic. Um, uh, and then finally is to be able to bring resources to bear to help the community. So when we first started this, um, this uh, journey, we were short on PPE. And so one of the roles we did at the government level was to really do everything we could to find and support our healthcare providers and the public in general with how to get PPE to help us manage the first part. Uh, where we are now with the vaccine is another great example of an important role of government. Uh, the, the government was able, the federal government was able to bring to bear its financial resources to um, basically accelerate uh, to, to pay those uh, wonderful uh, uh, manufacturers of these vaccines to do that and to do it in a way that was uh, low risk for them. Uh, and that was critical in terms of getting the vaccine to be developed quickly. Uh, and then here in the vaccination part to be able to coordinate the distribution of that vaccine. With limited supply, um, there has to be some way to do that in an orderly way. Otherwise, we get a bunch of chaos, uh, and that's been a role of government's played here. So uh, there are certainly many important parts that the private sector plays, uh, many, 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 but I've come to really appreciate the, the unique place that government has um, in that whole ecosystem of, of uh, providing for public health. Dr. Hahn, your perspective? Yeah, I certainly uh, agree with what the director said. I think I'll just add as I think about it through the years um, that um, the role of public health in my mind has been to, so I feel like we're sometimes that quiet glue between the healthcare system and the and the folks kind of keeping things all together. So there are, um, I think, for example, a doctor will treat a a patient with a, a E. coli infection, uh, give them antibiotics, maybe maybe give them uh, drugs to help make them feel better. Um, but they're not they're not paid to, and they're not um, they don't have the ability, the the time to interview that whole family, find out who else might be sick, find out whether uh, where did the heck did this person get their infection from? Did they eat some, you know, bring some contaminated food item into the home? And so we kind of silently behind the scenes, if you will, when we hear about that case of E. coli, we will go in and talk with the family and. Um, 
try to figure that out so that if there's an out, uh, a contaminated food product, we can get it off the shelves, right? So that nine times out of 10, we, we don't, uh, aren't able to pin it down. People say, well, I ate here, I ate there, and no, nobody else is sick, and you can't really sort it out. But then once in a while, I'm sure every the readership, uh, the viewership here uh, is aware of some of the large outbreaks that have occurred in Boise over the last few years where public health had to step in. Um, a source was identified, whether it was a restaurant, a grocery store, a deli, uh, and did end up having to either shut places down or to remove contaminated food items. So we're usually this kind of quiet in the background, folks. What this outbreak has done for me is to realize that in something, when something like this hits that's so big, that's so outside of our normal day to day, um, is the ability to partner more actively with the private sector. I think we work side by side usually and uh, physicians are very comfortable with public health. They're like, oh, thank you for, you know, we share information, we work together for the health of the community. In this case, we needed to step it up and we really need a lot of help from the private sector. We'll continue to with the vaccine effort. Um, is uh, the private sector, the physicians, the pharmacists, the hospitals, they're gonna be doing a lot of that vaccination. Public health can't do it by themselves. And seeing that uh, partnership and how that gets built uh, has been really interesting. And well, obviously just continue to have to grow in the next few months. You know, that's a, a comment that Dave said on our way out, I was thinking about is pharma, pharmaceutical companies sometimes get a bad rap and, but the public private partnership between these private companies and the federal government has really opened my eyes to the power of the way that our government can work. And I know that you two, um, we are so thankful that you two joined us today. We feel lucky to have learned from you. Um, I wanna thank Blue Cross of Idaho for consistently supporting issues in the state of Idaho and for being such an incredible member to the Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce. Director Jepson, Dr. Hahn, thank you for taking 50 minutes out of your day to help the public understand this more. And for the uh, viewers, next week we have a leadership forum with Speaker Bedke, Pro Tem Winder, Minority Leader Rubel, and Minority Leader Stennett. That's on Thursday at 8 a.m. Sorry, it's early, but that's when our legislators are available. And again, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you two so much for providing us with such